this on here, but that's all right. We'll put that there. Oh, I should probably move this too. <coughs> huh? I might figure it out one of these days. <laughs> okay. All right. I think that's good. Can everyone hear me? Good? Good? Okay. Perfect. Um, so good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to Catalyst. Um, thank you all so much for, for joining us this evening. I know that there are um, plenty of other things that you could be doing, and so we really appreciate um, you guys coming out tonight. Um, you know, it, it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking to all of you, and so I want to thank Nathaniel and Shandy again for um, this opportunity that I've um, been given again this semester. Uh, I've, I've had a really great time studying this passage and preparing, and, and so it's my hope that um, I'll be able to honor God's word tonight with, um, with this sermon. And so as many of you may or may not know, um, tonight we're going to be studying 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 25. <clears throat> and so before I really say anything of substance, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the interpretive challenges that come with this passage. Um, these challenges don't directly impact Paul's main point, which is what I'm going to be discussing at length tonight. Um, but they, they have caused some dispute among Christians in today's churches. And so I would just ask that um, as we approach this text, um, that we would do so with open minds and open hearts, um, and that we would be receptive of, of what God's word is, is really communicating through this passage. Um, and so, so many of you have probably at least have a, a basic knowledge of what Paul is writing about, um, namely the use of prophecy in tongues uh, in the church. <clears throat> and so I hope, however, that this sermon will not be taken as a uh, continuationist, cessationist debate, uh, by which I mean a discussion of you know, if the um, spiritual gifts are, are still used and alive in today's churches or if they have ceased and are, are no longer present. Um, and so to this point, I want to make two observations. Um, first, our personal stance on um, the presence or lack of spiritual gifts in the church um, are secondary to our faith in Jesus Christ for our salvation. You know, as Christians, we have both um, died to our sinful nature and, and have been raised to new life with the hope of eternal glory through the work of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and that's primary over any stance on, on spiritual gifts. And, and so the second point, um, and I, I'd like to quote uh, Wayne Grudem, he's an author of Systematic Theology, he makes this thought, uh, says it much more eloquently than I could, so I won't butcher it here. And um, so just to his point, um, he says, it can be argued that those in the charismatic and Pentecostal camps and those in the cessationist camps really need each other, and they would do well to appreciate each other more. The former tend to have more practical experience in the use of spiritual gifts and in vitality and worship that cessationists could benefit from if they were willing to learn. On the other hand, reformed and dispensational groups have traditionally been very strong in understanding of Christian doctrine and in a deep and accurate understanding of the teachings of Scripture. Charismatic and Pentecostal groups could learn much from them if they were willing to do so. And so I bring this up because ultimately I think that whichever side of that, that debate you would sit on, we both need each other and, and can learn from, from one another. So um, <clears throat> I'm not blind to the fact that the reader's stance on prophecy in tongues will influence parts of the interpretation of this passage. Um, but Paul's main point in writing to the Corinthians is in a way separated from that issue. Um, <clears throat> and so, so whichever side you sit on, I just have to be open to, to kind of what I have to say this evening. You know, when we look through 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul's writing about something greater than, than simply food offered to idols. That's what I spoke about last semester. Uh, when we look to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's writing about something greater than head coverings in the church. That's what Nicholas spoke on a couple weeks ago. Um, and so I would argue that in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul is writing about something greater than just prophecy in tongues. Um, and that's what we're going to unpack for the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, so I'm going to read the text in its entirety. It's kind of long, but I think it's important that we do that, and then I'll, I'll open us in prayer. So starting in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1. <clears throat> Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the, one who prophesy or for the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in a tongue, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even, even if lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? 
for you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourself, since you are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign for unbelievers, not for unbelievers, but for believers. If, therefore, the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues, and an outsider or unbeliever enters, they will, not say, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted, convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. And so I just ask you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, uh, we thank you for this evening. God, I thank you once again for the opportunity that you've given all of us to um, come together, to fellowship with one another, um, to sing praises to your name, to dive into your word. Um, God, I just ask you to be with all of us this evening. Um, I pray that um, that you would speak through me, that they would be your words and not mine. Um, I just ask that we would approach this text um, with um, open hearts and open minds to to what you're teaching through the words of Paul to the Corinthian church. Um, And again, God, I just ask uh, that this would be um, glorifying to you. Um, We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. So um, briefly, I just want to provide some background on this passage within the context of um, this letter. And so when we look at 1 Corinthians chapters 12 through 14, they act as a literary unit. Um, Chapter 12 starts a discussion of spiritual gifts, um, and it's kind of interjected by Paul's discourse on love within that context, and then closes with a continued emphasis on spiritual gifts, specifically prophecy and tongues. And so the content of all three of these chapters is is similar. It's, It's centered around spiritual gifts. Also, if you um, note in in 1 Corinthians 12, 31b, Paul ends this chapter with, and I will show you still a more excellent way, which is answered in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 with pursue love yet earnestly desire spiritual gifts. And so notice that uh, love is a major component of all three of these chapters, not just spiritual gifts. And so we want to keep that in mind as we're we're studying. Um, Now, when we add this to what we know of the previously mentioned chapters, so chapter 8, chapter 11, chapter 12, Um, we see that Paul has been and continues to admonish the Corinthians to sacrificially love one another regardless of their personal preference. And if you remember, this is kind of generally what we've been um, talking about for the last couple of weeks in sermons in a a really simplified way. And so the last thing, the last background piece I want to provide is just a general discussion or uh, a definition of the terms prophecy and tongues. Um, How these two terms are defined doesn't, you know, um, it, it does... Uh, is necessary in interpreting this passage, and so I just want to briefly define them as follows. So first, prophecy is the supernatural spirit-given communication of God's will and word to God's people. And so this is a simplified definition provided by F. David Farnell. He's he's a professor of the New Testament. Uh, The prophet Joel predicted in Joel chapter 2 that the gift of prophecy would be revived in the New Testament era, uh, and that's fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. And and thus, I believe that this is the prophecy that Paul is, is referring to in this passage. Um, So second, speaking in tongues is the miraculous ability to speak fluently in genuine foreign language that were previously unknown to the speaker. Um, This definition is again based on tongues referenced in Acts chapter 2, which I believe are the same tongues that that Paul is talking about here. Um, And so as as I mentioned, I don't want to discuss these terms at length because it's not the primary purpose of this passage. Um, This is just, you know, the, the means to which Paul addresses the issue. And tonight we're going to look at this um, passage in three sections, verses 1 through 5. Um, Paul presents the case for prophecy over tongues in the church. Verses 6 through 19, Paul presents uh, the challenge of tongues in the church. And then in verses 20 through 25, Paul presents the consequence of prophecy in the church. And that that should be in the U version tonight. Um, Now, so these divisions are um, all going to feed into Paul's main point that personal preference should never get in the way um, of serving others or edification over self-gratification. 
And so th this concept of edification or, or building up um, occurs in, in verses 3, 5, 12, and 17. Um, and, and that's really what Paul is focusing on. And so Paul is calling the Corinthians to um, put aside their selfish motives within the church and strive to build up others over themselves. And so each of these three sections of the passage kind of work together to form Paul's argument for prophecy over tongues and ultimately how prophecy edifies the church. And so let's begin breaking down this passage of scripture um, to, to develop this fully. So starting in, in verse one, uh, verses one through five, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies speaks in, or builds up the church. Now I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. For the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in a tongue, unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. And so from, the, from this passage of scripture, we can discern the following. The church is edified when members put the needs of others above their own. And so Paul opens this section of the letter with um, his call in verse 1 to pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. prophesy. And so Paul is, is highlighting the spiritual gift of, of prophecy, um, and he, he justifies this distinction in, in the verses that follow. And so he does so with two kind of parallel statements, um, first in verses 2 and 3 and followed by verse 4. And so the first statement, if, if you look to verses 2 and 3, kind of they point out who is spoken to through prophecy in tongues. So when someone's speaking in a tongue or an unknown language, they speak not to men but to God. Uh, whereas when one prophesies, he speaks to people. And so from these verses, we can conclude that prophecy is appealing over tongues primarily because of who is involved. Um, prophecy involves many, whereas tongues only involves the one speaking. And so the second set, set of statements found in verse 4 references not just um, who is involved, but the effect that it has on them. And so verse 4 states, the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. And so in this verse, Paul begins to kind of craft his argument that prophecy builds up the church, and that, and that prophecy should be preferred over speaking in tongues, and that speaking in unknown tongues only builds up an individual, whereas prophecy builds up the church. And, and Paul cements this concept in verse 5 when he says, you know, the, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. So again, we're seeing this ultimate goal of, of building up the church. You know, Paul's not primarily concerned with the spiritual gifts, but with the outcome of using them within the context of the church. So when one prophesies, he does so for building up or edification of the church, not just himself. So they're seeking edification over self-gratification. And so I'm in um, senior design right now in the civil department, um, and what this consists of for us is, is designing a, a hospital um, expansion. So a shout out to Jason, Taryn, and Josue for our, our team. Uh, <laughs> and so each member of our team is kind of uh, assigned a component of this design, um, but ultimately, ultimately at the end of the day, we have to um, come forth with a, with a completed design. And so if I approach this project only focused on my individual component and I go into team meetings and I only really care about things that are gonna benefit me, we're ultimately going to not have something to turn in at the end of the semester. And I think that that, that is kind of illustrating what Paul's point here in, in seeking to edify others above ourself. Um, and so how can we emulate this biblical principle of edifying our, others over ourselves? And so maybe as a modern day application of this passage, we have to ask ourselves, when we seek to become involved in the church, are we doing so to meet our own interests and desires or because we want to build up or edify the church and its members? Um, so, for example, when you, when you come to Catalyst, do you tend to um, sit with your friends, people that you know, or, or do you consider sitting with someone who's alone? I'm not saying that it's bad to sit with your friends, but, um, you know, this is such a small gesture of sitting with someone who's sitting alone or someone you don't know, um, but you have no idea how, how big of an impact that could have on someone who's having a really bad day or maybe just doesn't know anyone here. Um, you know, th this concept becomes more applicable in a so society that's centered uh, around this consumer mindset. Um, unintentionally this idea of get rather than give can creep into our churches. And so when we approach service in the church, it should first be for the edification of others, not for our own personal benefit. We have to guard ourselves from the thinking of, I'm here so the church pours into me, uh, not so I can pour myself into others. Um, and so within the context of the church, we, we have to seek edification over self-gratification. Um, Ultimately, Paul calls us to take an active role in building up the church, but this comes with its own set of challenges, and this is where Paul turns next, um, if you'd read with me in verses 6 through 19. 
Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? If even lifeless instruments such as the flute or the harp do not give distinct notes, how will anyone know what is played? And if the bugle gives an indistinct sound, who will get ready for battle? So with yourselves, if with your tongue you utter speech that is not intelligible, how will anyone know what is said? For you will be speaking into the air. There are doubtless many different languages in the world, and none is without meaning. But if I do not know the meaning of the language, I will be a foreigner to the speaker, and the speaker a foreigner to me. So with yourself, since you are eager for the manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. And so from this passage of scripture, we can uh, discern the following. If something cannot be understood by those present, it will not serve to edify the church. And so Paul has already stated his case for prophecy over tongues uh, within the context of the church, but now he turns his attention to identify the shortcomings of speaking in tongues in a corporate worship setting. And so Paul states his concern in verse 6 when he says, Now, brothers, if I come to you speaking in tongues, how will I benefit you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? And so the specific nature of this concern may be difficult to, to, to pull out of this verse, but luckily Paul continues to provide three illustrations for us of what he's trying to say. And so um, ultimately what he's, what he's talking about, the main issue here is unintelligibility. And, and I, I wish I had a better word. I tried to find a shorter one that would convey the same thought. I know it's a, a kind of a long, awkward word. But in short, Paul's expressing that if no one can understand what you're saying, then what good will you be in building up or edifying the church and its members? And so first Paul relates uh, a lifeless instrument not playing distinct notes to a person speaking in tongues. Just as random notes on a flute or on a harp don't make any sensical music, speaking in tongues is useless if you don't speak that language. Um, in the same way, verses 8 and 9, a bugle that gives an indistinct sound will not alert soldiers to, to ready for battle. Something, whether sound or language, um, that is not distinct and intelligible will not bring knowledge to anyone. Um, and then finally, in, in his third illustration, Paul kind of fully explains this concept with human language. Um, in, in verses 10 and 11, he identifies uh, the point of spoken language, that is to communicate information, not to impress or confuse the speaker or the listener. Um, and, and so these illustrations are, are showing Paul's concern with speaking in tongues was that within the context of the church, uh, words spoken in unknown languages would not be understood by those present and thus would not benefit anyone. Um, and he, he concludes um, the first half of this section, verse 12, with a reminder to strive to excel in building up the church, which again is ultimately Paul's main point of this whole passage of scripture, that we are supposed to strive for edification over self-gratification. And so what then um, are, are we to do with people who were given the gifts of tongues? And so Paul never condemns the, the gift of tongues, and he even points out that he speaks in tongues more than all of them. Um, he does, however, encourage that those who do speak in tongues to, to pray for the power of, to interpret in verse 13. Um, verses 14 through 17, Paul points out that it's, it's necessary for those who speak in tongues to pray for interpretation of what they're saying. You know, intelligibility is the key focus to this point. Um, and he, he even creates a scenario in which one person is praying in a tongue and, and someone cannot say amen to their prayer. And why? It's because they don't know what they're saying. Um, Paul addresses the issue of unintelligibility in verse 17 when he says that ultimately the other person is not being built up. And so again, we're still seeing this ultimate goal of, of see, striving for edification with the use of these gifts. And, and, and so again, this reminds us that Paul's main point is, is not to shame the use of tongues, but to remind the Corinthians that within the context of the church, uh, tongues that consist of unintelligible speech do not build up others. And so in a similar fashion to, to kind of how Paul ends 1 Corinthians chapter 8, um, if you remember, Paul writes, Nevertheless, in church I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. So ultimately, Paul would rather say far less to have it mean far more. Um, ultimately, speech that is to be edifying to others uh, must be intelligible and understood. 
And so um, when I look out into the, the, the audience tonight, I see a, a bunch of different departments represented. I, and I, like I said, I'm from the civil department. Um, but if I took a short walk over to the physics building, um, I'm sure that I could walk into um, a, many classrooms and, and sit down and have absolutely no idea what they were talking about. Um, it just would be way over my head and I, I would not understand anything. Um, I'm not saying that these would be bad classes, um, but if I can't understand what they're saying, it's not going to make me any smarter. Um, it's not going to have you know, any effect on, on me. Um, and I think that this parallels Paul's point for this, for this section. If you want to look at it from another perspective, if you uh, look to Matthew chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, um, in this passage, Jesus begins to speak to his disciples in parables. Uh, a few verses before this, he um, is giving the parable of the sower. And so the disciples ask him, they say, well, why are you teaching this way? Um, and, and he responds, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Now, before anyone uh, runs away with this one, let me make it clear that um, I'm not implying that tongues were meant to conceal the truth from others, uh, like the parables concealed the truth from the Pharisees. But because the Pharisees did not understand the style and language that Jesus was preaching in, the content of what he was saying had no edifying impact on them. And, and the same holds true for speaking in tongues. If your speech cannot be understood, it, it only gets in the way of building up others. And so we can apply this concept when we ask ourselves, when we're actively serving in the church, are we doing things that will be clearly understood by members of the church? Or, or more specifically, uh, this question can be asked about our involvement in this ministry. You know, am I clear in my motives and explanation of the things that I'm doing uh, while I'm serving in this ministry? Because if not, it's likely that what we're doing really won't have an impact on those who are involved. Um, I could have come up here tonight and presented a um, detailed verse-by-verse -verse, uh, study of this passage. I could have referenced five commentaries and, and four versions of the Bible. Um, would this have been um, useful in some contexts? Sure, I think that it would have. Um, would everyone here have been able to completely understand and, and take away every single detail? Probably not. Um, you know, it would be very easy to become lost in the midst of that. Um, and ultimately, it would not have had an edifying effect, edifying effect on, on the people who are here. Um, and so instead, I, I prepared a sermon that's hopefully communicating Paul's main point of this passage, edification over self-gratification. And so now let's turn to the, the final verses of this, of this chapter to, to finish out, or this section to finish out tonight. And so in verse 20, brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people, and even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers but for believers. If therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and an outsider or unbeliever enters, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so, falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. And so from these verses, uh, we can discern the following. So just as prophecy leads to unbelievers acknowledging God, edifying practices within the church today will lead to growing the body of Christ. And so Paul begins this section um, with his call not to be children in your thinking, to be infants in evil, and to be mature in their thinking. And so Paul's using the phrase infants here kind of in a positive manner regarding evil, be infants in evil, and children in a negative manner regarding their thinking. Um, but ultimately, these two phrases are, are, are suggesting the same type of mature Christian behavior. You know, Paul here is, is ultimately asking the, the Corinthians to set aside emotion and experience um, and other prideful attitudes to see the true purpose of the spiritual gift, and that is edification of the church. In these last few verses of the section, Paul introduces a new element um, into his, his discussion, um, the unbeliever. Now, up to this point, Paul is primarily focused on believing members of the church body, um, and their actions relative to one another. But now in verses 20 through 25, Paul mentions the unbeliever's reaction to both prophecy and tongues. Um, the interpretation of verses 21 and 22 requires quite a bit of discussion, so just for brevity, I'll, I'll provide kind of a, a summary of, of the main concept here um, that Paul is presenting through his reference to the prophet Isaiah when he says um, it is written in the law. Um, you know, he, he's referencing Isaiah. Um, Paul is stating here that just as God pronounced judgment upon the nation of Israel through foreign tongues, so tongues will be a sign of judgment to unbelievers. And so, on the contrary, prophecy will be a sign of God's presence, uh, salvation among believers. You know, this is, again, this is a, a brief point, but I think it presents the, the, the spirit of, of this text here. Um, 
And so to kind of to reinforce that and clarify his point further, um, and as Paul's kind of last statement of this section, he relates the effect of both prophecy and tongues uh, on unbelievers. And so it's important to, t- to take a minute to note here that Paul recognizes the possibility of there being unbelievers present in a corporate worship service. Um, and that's something that we also experience today in, in today's churches. And so when we look to verses 23 through 25, um, Paul depicts an, an unbeliever um, entering kind of two different scenarios here. And so if we read in verses 23 through 25, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and an outsider or unbeliever enters, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. And so you can see we, we have two very different reactions of the unbeliever in, the, in these two churches. Um, you know, what is his reaction to um, the unbeliever who enters the church where all speak in tongues? Well, he says everyone is out of their minds. Ultimately, he, he assumes that they're crazy. Whereas the second scenario where all prophesy yields a very different result. When the unbeliever enters the church where all prophesy, in verses 24 through 25 say, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all, the secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. I mean, this is literally a best case scenario um, that, that we could think of. Instead of proclaiming you're out of your minds, the unbeliever, unbeliever proclaims God is among you. Um, and so prophecy in the second scenario led to not only edifying uh, the church, but also bringing a sinner to his knees before the Lord. And so I think that the, these two parts together provide a great model for what edification of the church really encompasses. And so while I think that the illustration of this passage is, is pretty clear, um, if you'd picture with me two classrooms, um, and for the sake of this uh, illustration, let's pretend that you are students not repulsed by the idea of going to class to learn. Um, and so, you know, in the first classroom, we have students sitting nicely in their desks. They're all in rows. They're taking notes. The teacher's at the board um, speaking and interacting with them and, and writing, whereas in, in the second classroom, we have uh, three or four or five different groups of students talking about ten, five different subjects. Uh, there may be a couple students who are reading out of books. The teacher's asleep at his desk. You know, if you're trying to decide which, which class is, is going, you're going to get anything from, you're likely going to turn around and walk out of the second class and, and walk into the first class. Um, you know, th- there, there is no way that you could um, have any edifying impact or you would not learn anything in the second classroom just because of the, the chaos that's, that's um, going on. Now, um, this is kind of a, uh, a good transition into the next um, section of verses that Adam's going to be teaching on in a couple weeks. But Paul's main point still holds true. Um, the Corinthians were to seek prophecy over tongues not just because of its edifying effect on others, um, but because in doing so they could positively affect unbelievers um, as well as members of the church. And so we, we can apply this concept by when we ask ourselves, when we take part in any function of the church, do we consider how our actions will be perceived by those outside of the church who visit? Because as I said, you know, um, just as outsiders visit the Corinthian church, um, I think that it's safe to say that on any given Sunday um, that there are unbelievers in all of our churches to some extent. And so are, are these people going to see um, individuals seeking to build themselves up, or are they going to see a group of people working to encourage, exhort, and edify one another for the betterment of the church? I think Paul is, is presenting kind of a, a correlation um, between churches with members who seek to edify the church and churches who uh, bring unbelievers to Christ, and I don't think that's an accident. Um, you know, as active church members, we have to realize that the people who visit our churches can see the difference between people who genuinely serve the church in order to build up and encourage others and those who are self-seeking and only participating for their own gain. And so as the worship team comes back up um, tonight, I, I want to just take a brief moment to reflect on, on everything that we've talked about um, and kind of how it relates to Paul's call for edification over self-gratification. We've seen how our motives and actions in the church should be primarily rooted in building up others before ourselves. We've also seen that if, if something isn't you know, beneficial or can be understood by the majority of people present, it's not going to have any lasting or edifying effect on them. And finally, we've seen that the focus on edification extends beyond building up current members of the church, but it extends to future ones. Um, And so these three points, again, work to communicate Paul's um, theme of this passage, that as Christians, we should set aside our selfish motives and and strive to to build up one another within the context of the church. Um, And again, you know, this point is not found in in defining the terms prophecy or tongues or even determining if these gifts are are present today. Um, Paul is admonishing a church who sought personal gain over the edification of the church. 
And, and you know, some, some churches today are even experiencing this problem. And, and if we're being honest with ourselves at times, I think that we can experience a little bit of this um, attitude regarding our service to the church or this ministry. Um, but from, from careful study of this text, we're reminded um, through the words of Paul that we should strive for edification over self-gratification in every aspect of our ministry. And so I, I would challenge all of you um, to consider Paul's calling here, um, whether it's in your local church, whether it's in CCF or, or in your church at home, um, and that by doing so, we would be able to, to glorify God in his manifestation, that is the church um, on this earth. And so um, would you pray with me? Uh, Father, again, we thank you uh, once again for, for this time that we have to meet. Um, God, I just ask that your word would resonate within us. Um, I just pray that um, as we go out and as, as we actively serve within ministry, I pray that that would be our, our motive, that we would um, seek to build up others before ourselves. Um, God, again, I, I just thank you for the, for the blessing that this, this ministry is on this campus. I just pray that you would continue to um, be with us and strengthen us to continue to fulfill the, the mission that you've set before us. Um, and again, God, we thank you for everything that you've given us, the many um, blessings you've poured out, the mercies that you've shown us. Um, and again, we thank you most of all for your son, Jesus, and it's in his name that we pray. Amen.